it's sort of a mirror image. So I want to, I'll be talking about my assumptions and definitions, because I think that's really helpful to get down and kind of have, make people have the same language. I'm going to be talking about racism today, and then we're going to be thinking about ways to combat racism, relating to a lot of the questions that you just asked. Feel free to stop me at any time with questions. Um, just jump right in. So, I want to start with sort of a, a big idea that I don't want to forget, and I don't want us to forget, which is that racism is both individual and institutional. If there's one thing that I do when I teach kindergartners, graduate students, and high school students, it's to try to get this idea across. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at is the ways that those two things work and how they intersect, how the individual and the institutional come together when it comes to things like racism. The feminist phrase was, the personal is political, um, and that's the same idea. All right, my assumptions are, you've all heard this, but let's talk about what it means. Race is socially and historically constructed. The US government decided that in order to be considered black, you had to have a drop of black blood. Right? So that definition was defined by the government. Let's just say first that we know scientifically that there's no such thing as race. Right? Anthropologists say that the DNA, the differences in DNA between me and this white guy right here are no more or less, no more significant than the differences in DNA between me and that black guy right there. Right? It's not about, race it doesn't exist scientifically. Race sure is still important, however, socially. Right? We, we characterize each other racially, we get put in boxes by race, we get treated differently because of race. How has that happened? So the US government says, if you have a drop of black blood, you're black. Why would they have done that? Hmm. I don't know. They just made that definition up. But on the other hand, they said that if you're Native American, to be Native American, you have to be full-blooded Indian. Now that's kind of weird, right? That you only have to have a drop of black blood to be black, but you have to be full-blooded Indian to be Indian. Why would the same body of people have made those two very different measures of what it means to be a certain race? Jane, who said um, you had to be full-blooded Indian? That well, if you want to make a claim to the land, if you want to make a claim to tribal lands, you have to prove that you are really an Indian. Okay, so take even take that quarter, right? The the fights over how we get to define ourselves are really important. And if a drop of black blood versus a quarter, we still have a discrepancy here, right? right. So why would that discrepancy exist? Who benefits from having the definition be a drop or a quarter? White people. Let's be specific. Who benefits in 1822? I'm thinking about slave owners. Why would they want a drop of black blood to define you as black? Because then you can have more slaves, right? Then if, if slavery, if you have slaves, then you can have more slaves. More people are classified as slaves. Who benefits by having fewer people be defined as Indian and they can claim to Native American lands. The people who want that land. My argument is simplistic, it's overly simplistic. But, but what I'm trying to point out is that race has been socially constructed through history and that it's been done not just randomly but because of political and economic reasons. Yeah, so I appreciate the, the qualification. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that this is not just a random system. That, that we think of the Irish, we didn't think of the Irish as white, and then the Irish became white. That, that, that has economic consequences, yeah? Okay, my second um, assumption. In LA, apparently there's a lot of smog. It's pretty hard to move around LA, apparently, without breathing in that smog, right? I would argue that racism in our culture is a smog. And I'm gonna talk specifically about the United States, Although racism globally is exists, I'm going to try. I'm going to talk most specifically about specifically about it in our culture. 
Um, but I would say that you can't grow up in this culture without breathing in the smog of racism. Yeah? So what I want you to do for a minute is think about how did you first learn about difference? Okay, so when I was eight years old, I was sitting in the back of my mother's car with uh, her friend's daughter, who was a black girl, and we were looking, we were comparing tongues, and we were talking about whether our tongues were the same color or not, even though our skins were different colors. Okay, so that was the first time I consciously thought about difference in terms of race. I want you to think right now about how you first learned about difference in terms of race. Through what medium, through what organization, through what people. Just take a minute. Well, hang on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you tell the person next to you for just a second how you learned about it. And I just want you to take a minute. Tell the person next to you how you learned about difference. <laughs> Let me show you an image that I think is helpful. It's called the wheel of oppression. 
So oppression happens in lots of ways, and I don't think it's useful to say that racism is worse than sexism, and homophobia is worse than ageism. I don't think that's useful. I think it's useful to see it as a wheel, and they're all just spokes on the wheel, right? So we've got racism, we've got ableism, we've got sexism, we've got xenophobia. It depends on where I am as to which is most salient at the moment. I wasn't Jewish until I moved to Iowa, right? <laughs> In New York City, I'm not Jewish. It never comes up, it's not an issue. Yom Kippur, everybody takes off anyway. In Iowa, that was a topic of conversation with my Judaism. And I'm not even, I mean, I'm not even Jewish. My dad's Jewish, which doesn't make me Jewish, right? But the fact is, is that in certain circumstances, certain aspects of my personality and my identity are more salient than others. So I don't think it's helpful to say that anti-Semitism is the, the thing on the top of the list, because that depends on where I am. And finally, I can't separate out my religion from my sexual orientation, from my gender, from my class, from my race, right? Audrey Lord says, it's not like I'm a lesbian from 9 to 10 in the morning, and then at 10 I become a black woman, and then at 11, et cetera, right? So I think this is really helpful when we talk about oppressions, to say that they're intersecting and they're compounding, but they're distinct. People want to always turn race into a conversation about class. Because for some reason, it's often easier to talk about class than it is to talk about race. I, I should call for that, but I won't. <laughs> Claro, are we good? Do you see how these are assumptions that I think are working assumptions that might be useful to have as part of the beginning part of a conversation? Kind of get us all talking about what we mean? Yeah, okay. Um, some more definitions to get us talking about what we mean. I think it's helpful, really helpful, if the only thing you do with your students is to say what's the difference between personal prejudice and institutionalized oppression, that's great. It's a great place to start. So, prejudice. You know what? I really like, I, I just have to I just kind of like redheads. I think red hair is really attractive. People who have freckles, I just really like it. I, I'm prejudiced. What can I say? I like redheads. It's just a judgment that I have based on a generalization. Now, some redhead might walk in the room and I, they might be somebody I don't like, but I'm going to be prejudiced and think that I like them. Okay. Now, I could explain lots of prejudices that aren't so nice, and you can all imagine what they are. Discrimination now is different. It's an action based on a prejudice. So, before I said that I really had kept this prejudice for redheads to myself, but actually, if you look in my classroom, you'll notice that the redheads tend to be sitting in the front row, mm -hmm. and they get opportunities for extra credit, and I talk to them more kind of outside class, so I discriminate when it comes to life. So my prejudice comes out in my actions. That's discrimination, right? Institutionalized oppression is when it's not just me, Bolgatz who teaches seventh grade history, <coughs> but systemically and systematically, certain groups of people are oppressed or privileged based on their membership in a group. That's when it becomes oppression or um, privilege. So if when the redheads go to the hospital, they get better care, when the redheads go to a bank and they get a lower, lower mortgage rate, when the redheads go to schools and they get more qualified teachers, when the redheads are shown different houses by the real estate agent, that's when we're talking about institutionalized oppression, right? When the laws of the land are written so that redheads get privileged. Now, this is a silly example, but you get my point, right? So this is the definitions that I think are important. Prejudice, discrimination, and institutionalized oppression. Yeah? We all know this. We've been there. It's helpful, though, to lay it out. Last definition is the idea of internalized oppression or domination. This is a tricky one because it's not conscious. I don't consciously think that white people are better than anyone else. But I've internalized this idea. I breathed in the smog, and everyone else breathed in, and I think I'm actually, my group is better. Right? I also internalized the idea that men are actually a little bit more competent than women. Now, rationally, do I know that's not true? Yeah. But I've internalized this notion. Right? So this is a tough one, and it's tough because it's hard to see. Let me just give you a little warning, though. If a, if, a, if a woman of color straightens her hair, 
because she thinks that straight hair is beautiful and more beautiful than kinky hair. You could think that that might be internalized oppression if she's not aware of it, if it's this unconscious thing. She may, however, be a very savvy banker and know that if she's going to get ahead in the banking world, she has to look a certain way. Right? So that's the difference. Internalized oppression or domination is when you're not aware of it. Right? If I'm not coming out to my colleagues as a lesbian, it's not necessarily because I have internalized homophobia. It might simply be because I know that I'm going to get, I'm going to have a hard time doing my job and being promoted if I, if I come out. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I preaching to the choir? Raise your, your heads when I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> so let's get going. Um, I think that when you talk to people, you got to talk about the racism that exists and you got to give them some really clear examples. So I'm going to give you some clear examples. We're going to choose education and we're going to choose foster care. Um, study that was done in 2002 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They um, surveyed the whole senior class of the high school. 89% of the class, uh, I'm sorry, 78% of the class gave back to the survey, which is a really high response rate. They said, do you want to take AP classes? So about 50% of the African Americans said, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in taking AP or honors math, AP or honors English. We can't look at the Asian data because there's too few to count, so let's ignore that. Latinos, about in the 50s, said, yeah, I'm interested in taking AP or honors classes. <coughs> Whites, interesting, they had 35% wanted to take AP math, 63% wanted to take AP or honors English. Um, and then multiracial kids fell in about the 40s, okay? Okay, that's the kids wanting to take an AP or an honors course. Now, let's look at what happened in the kids' mind when they filled out the survey. They asked the kids, to what extent have your counselors encouraged you to take honors or AP classes? While the African Americans said that they are, 50% of them about said they wanted to take AP classes, only 43% of them said that their counselors had encouraged them to take those classes. As opposed to whites, where 35% had said they were interested in taking math classes, 63% had been interested in taking AP or Honors English, and 66% said that their counselors had encouraged them. Look at Latinos. 54, 57% wanted to take higher level English and math classes, but only 36 said that they had encouraged to do that by their counselors. Okay. I bring this example because I think it illustrates a couple of things. I think it illustrates racism. Right? that kids are not being encouraged to take high-level classes. I also think it's an important example because I think it speaks to intention. Did those counselors walk into Cambridge High School and say, I want to be racist today. I want to discourage the kids of color in my school from taking high-level courses. Raise your hand if you think that that's how they walk in the door. <laughs> I would argue, and the folks who talk about this thing called critical race theory argue, that intentions don't matter. I don't give a toss how they walked in the door. I care about the results, which is that the kids of color felt like they were not being encouraged to take AP or honors classes. That's a racist system, no matter what the intentions were of the counselors. Okay? So if you're in schools, which many of you are, I think you have to look not at the intentions, but at the outcomes. Okay. Um, another example of racism today, just because I think it's helpful to have some data. Foster care, we know that there's many studies that have shown that there's no higher incidence of neglect or abuse in African American homes than there are in any other homes in, of any other racial group. We know that. However, interesting, 15% of the kids in the United States are black, kids under 18. 36.6%, this is a study from 2004, 36.6% of the kids in the foster care system are black. So that means that while it should be a one-to-one -one ratio, if there's 15% of the kids in the country who are black, you'd think that 15% of the kids in foster care are black, given that there's no more abuse or neglect in black homes than there is in white homes. But we have, you're, you're almost two and a half more times, times more likely to get thrown into foster care. Okay. So the foster care system is ripping apart black families disproportionately. In Vermont, the numbers are about the same. In fact, they're a little bit worse.
Racism is not just back in the day. This is another thing that is really helpful to know when you talk to people, because they'll say, yeah, but we have a black president. How many of you have heard that? <coughs> Remind them, the black president, I, I just read this statistic, that the, the increase in death threats to the president from Bush to Obama, 400% increase. In, in, now that's scary. So don't talk to me about post-race. Okay. It's not back in the day. Let me give you a very quick example, and this comes from the Annie Casey Foundation. Am I talking too quickly? No. Okay. No. Um, I want to get through this because I think the meat of this is going to be our conversation. So I want to just sort of whip through this a little bit. Um, this comes from the Annie Casey Foundation, who does great work. Um, and they looked at this kid, Philip. His dad was a, a soldier in World War II. His dad only got a high school diploma, but with, fought in the war, got the GI Bill. Because of the GI Bill, the dad was able to get a low interest mortgage and move the family into a white suburb. Okay? So Philip's family borrowed against the equity of the home. Philip went to college, he became a professional, he bought a house, and he inherits his, his parents' house. Get the picture? Now, there's another kid, exact same story. His dad was low income, only a high school grad, grew up in Philadelphia. He went to the World War II too. He came back, but under that GI Bill, he was not able to access the home loan because there was racially restrictive underwriting criteria. My brother, my age, lived in Oakland, California. On his, the deed on his house, it said that he could not sell that house to African Americans. Now, did he sell his house to African Americans? He could have, but there's lots of ways that the laws of the land restricted folks of color from buying houses in neighborhoods where they're going to be able to have their um, home value increase. So as a result, this kid, Juan, couldn't go to college using equity from his dad's house. He certainly didn't, wasn't able to buy his own house because he was still living in inner city Philadelphia where the schools were under-resourced. And he didn't have equity to buy his own house, equity to call, go to college, couldn't buy his own house. And indeed, he had to you know, pay for his dad's funeral instead of inheriting his dad's house. Do you see how the racism of the GI Bill and the, the time that that came out still impacts folks today, their, their, their wealth in the country? There's a great book called The Color of Wealth that talks all about these inequities, including, for example, the wealth in Native American communities and how that's differently allocated and, and you know, they're not able, Native Americans aren't able to uh, control that wealth in the ways that whites are. I mean, there's just lots of examples of the ways that we need to look both at income and wealth when we think about discrepancies of um, opportunity in this country. Okay. Um, so. What's a girl to do? <laughs> I want to go back to the thing that I said earlier, which is that racism is individual and institutional. And I want to talk about both of those things. But I want to remember that you can't divorce them. For the moment, though, for the purposes of talking, I'm going to divorce them. I'm going to talk first about the micro, the home, the office, the living room, whatever. What can you do? I would say that you need to prepare yourself. So for example, you gotta have some of this information about racism today, otherwise when you're talking to people and they say, but we have a black president, you don't have any answer. Well, there's still racism. Yeah, Just prove it. Well, you gotta have some proof, right? Um, you also have to pr prepare yourself by thinking about your own place of privilege and oppression in society. So I have to look at my own whiteness. And I have to know what that means before I can start to have conversations either with other white people or with people of color. I need to have that preparation. We can talk more about that. Um, you have to initiate the conversation. I don't know if you saw the latest, or it was probably two weeks ago, the Newsweek cover. Mm -hmm. yes. It said, are babies racist? Yeah. And these researchers tried to do a study where they said to these white families, they, they had three sets. They had a set that was going to show the kids just multicultural videos. These were all white kids. Multicultural videos. Then they had a set that said, oh, parents, will you talk about the videos with your kids? I, I'm not doing this exactly right. And then they had a set, will you have conversations with your kids about race? White parents. The kids, when they started, they had certain attitudes about race. And when they finished, they basically had the same attitudes about race. The researchers were like, didn't do any good, watching videos, having conversations. But then what they did was they went and they looked at the diaries of the parents. And as it turns out, those white folks had not been able to have those conversations. 
conversations with their kids. They didn't know how to do it. They were worried about what would happen. And so my argument is that you have got to initiate conversations about race. All the time, everywhere, anytime, always. Or it's not going to happen. It's not just going to bubble up naturally. I would argue that it does bubble up and we ignore it. A kid says, why is your skin so dirty? And we say, shh. Heaven forbid we say, that's, that's a different color skin. Let's talk about that. But we don't. We shush that, right? Why is that person in a wheelchair? Shh. Right? And certainly, we're teaching physics, and we've got to get to our physics class, and so we're not going to talk about the comment that comes in when kids are walking in the door in the classroom. Right? So I think you have to initiate conversations. And finally, you've got to be persistent and patient, because it's not going to be this beautiful, nice, la, la, la land of, oh, we're just going to start talking about race, and everybody's going to have a good time, and we're going to all be on the same page. It's going to be messy, it's going to be awkward, and it's going to be, at times, angry, and at times, resistant. So you've got to just keep coming, keep coming. Um, the image that I'm going to show you at the end is of an escalator coming down. Racism is a down escalator, and you've got to keep walking up the stairs. If you stop for a minute, you'll just get pushed right back down. Right? So you've got to be persistent in this conversation. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I want you to think about how much you're actually doing it. Right? Okay. Nobody's stopping you with questions. I'm a little worried. You okay? <laughs> All right. Some of the stuff that I found in my research when I looked at two teachers who tried to talk about race and racism is that it's really helpful to ask questions. So you ask the question, what do you mean and how do you know? So that when somebody says, we don't have any more racism, or when somebody says, um, affirmative action is really bad, or when somebody says anything along those lines, you just say, what do you mean? And oh, how do you know? Or, as I said on the radio this morning, a guy was in a bar and he was listening to his, the, the guys at the bar look at Obama and call him a really nasty name. And he said, I can't talk to these guys, they're, they, they're just, they're idiots. Well, you can ask them, what, what, what does that term mean? Why are you using that term? You can ask that question. It's amazing how disarming those questions can be. What do you mean and how do you know? Um, I think it's really important to provide and look for evidence which is why I gave you a couple of pieces of evidence tonight. I think it's really important to model how to be human. It doesn't work very well, I don't think, to talk the talk but not walk the walk, right? So if you are in your classroom, rah-rah talking about race, and then you're being disrespectful of the janitor who is a black man who's coming in to empty your garbage, kids will read that that hidden curriculum much more strongly than they're going to read your explicit curriculum, right? You've got to even look at why is it that all the janitors are people of color and the lunch, the people who are serving lunch are people of color and all the teachers are white, if that's the situation in your school. You've got to be looking at that stuff. Which leads me to my next idea, which is that the personal is great, the conversations are great, but you've got to look institutionally. You've got to look at the big picture, okay? Michael Fullan, who talks about school change, says that in any organization, you're going to have a third of the people with you, a third of the people against you, and a third of the people uncommitted. So if you're thinking about how do you change things, you start small with a third of the people that you know you can do something with. You bring on board the third of the people who are just kind of like floating, and you neutralize the folks who are against. Okay. Now, I know you're saying to me, okay, well, guys, we're paying you the big bucks. How do you neutralize them? Part of the way that you neutralize them is by mobilizing the first two thirds. You've got to have your eyes on the prize. And if you're always saying, but I can't do that because the dean is this, I can't do that because the principal is that, I can't do that because you're just stopping on the escalator and the escalator is pushing you down. I want to know how you're moving forward. Um, I can give you an example about curriculum. Would that be helpful for folks? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody asked about multicultural versus anti-racist. I want to talk about that. So there's all different ways that we can have curriculum. <coughs> we can have exclusionary. Exclusionary means that you're promoting racist ideas. You'd be surprised at how much of our curriculum actually is exclusionary. We just don't talk about race. We just don't mention folks of different colors, we assume that everybody is white people. But, but a lot of our, our, 
recovery from is a positive. It's, it's a neutral, right? So you talk about the New Deal and you say how great the New Deal was. For farmers in the United States. Well, the fact is, is that the New Deal wasn't very good if you were a black farmer. It was good if you were a white farmer. But a passive curriculum doesn't mention that, right? A multicultural curriculum has a nice sidebar about the black scientist who invented, I don't know, the heart palpitation machine. But doesn't talk about how science has differentially impacted folks of color versus white people. Okay? Multicultural means that we have Black History Month in February and the black kids cringe because they're so sick of hearing the Rosa Parks story every single February. Right? Right? And folks, let me just tell you, they're mostly only talking about black people. That in itself is a problem with the way that we do multiculturalism, right? Um, now, what we want to be getting at is an anti-racist curriculum. I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. You're doing a recycling unit with your fourth graders. Now, this is what a lot of teachers do. It's great to get the kids to learn, you know, what's garbage, where does your garbage go, how, does it, how could you have less garbage, we don't want to fill up the landfill. Nice unit, right? How can we make that an anti-racist unit? Talk about environmental racism. Talk about environmental racism. Where the heck are the landfills being placed? In whose community are those landfills being placed? Right? It's a simple question, but it transforms your curriculum from being a nice unit about recycling to being, being an anti-racist unit about the whole systemic issue of institutionalized racism. Yeah? Um, math problems. I, I, I watched, I, I, there's a, a TV show, I don't even know if it's still in the air, called The Wire. And the, there's a brand new white math teacher in this school in Baltimore, in of Baltimore, black and Latino kids, <coughs> rough school, you know, it's very much characterized as violent rough. So he comes in and he wants the kids to do this problem about, if you want to go from here to there, how long is it going to take you if you go 27 miles per hour? And the kids are like, why don't we want to go over there? <laughs> <laughs> Math problems are not neutral. If you figure out that I'm not going to walk through that neighborhood because I am going to get assaulted in that neighborhood if I'm a person of color, my distance from here to there is going to be this. <laughs> right? It's a different distance. Why not bring that into your curriculum? It's the same thing. You're still learning whatever you need to learn about perimeters and, and distance. But you've got a different level of conversation going on in your classroom. The, 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 okay? There's a question about Disney selling t-shirts. And they buy the t-shirts for $4, and they sell them in Disneyland for $12. How much profit do they make? Pretty typical math problem, right? What if we ask, how much money are the people who made the t-shirts making? <laughs> and who's making the profit, and what's happening to the people who are making the amount of money that they're making in making those t-shirts? Do you see where I'm going with this? You can have the same exact math problem and bring in an element that really helps kids think about the implications of what it means to live in the world. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering if you could explain um, the purpose of emphasizing the, the differences in how people are treated. Like, like, having all these examples, and why, why is that important? Why is it important to, to, for example, have a math problem where you say some people can't walk this straight line? Well, yeah, like, I, I understand your point that, like, you're educating yourself and educating kids, but, like, really, like, emphasizing a point over and over, why is that important? It's a really, really good question. I think it's important because schools are meant to help people become democratic citizens. And in order to be a democratic citizen, I have to understand what it means to live with a lot of different people and care about them. And structure my society in such a way that we all live together truthfully. So if in my education I never have to look at the ways in which our dem dem democracy is not working, and I can just think of myself, and my own happiness, I'm not learning how to be a democratic citizen. I'm just learning how for me to get ahead. I care that 
the people in my society all care about each other and that we are worried about everyone being okay. So I want the kids in the fourth grade to be paying attention not just to how to do the math problem, but to the implications of their knowledge. About to what end are they using their knowledge? Are they using it for good or are they using it for selfish purposes? Does that answer your question? Yeah. What I'm hearing in your question though is, do we always have to bring up this negative stuff? <coughs> it's depressing. I mean, is, is that part of your question? Um, I guess I just didn't, I didn't understand it. It felt to me that it might compound the problem. Like, just pointing out the difference over and over and over again. Like, are we just creating a bigger gap between... <coughs> That's exactly what the people in this study that they did with the video, they, the white folks who didn't want to talk to their kids about race, they said that. They said, well, if I talk about race, will it get worse? Kids are learning about race. They're learning about it all the times in the same exact ways that you that you learned about race, right? And so for us to say that not talking about it will make it worse is to ignore the fact that it's it's pretty bad. And and we're assuming that just because we're not talking about it, it's gonna get better on its own, which it's not. So I would argue that bringing it up is not actually making it worse. Depends on how you bring it up, though. If you just bring it up in a way that has kids thinking simplistically about race, for example, um, there was a study that showed that kids who read a, um, a story about Jackie Robinson, and just read Jackie Robinson was the first black in the major leagues, their attitudes about race didn't change. The kids who were told, by the way, Jackie Robinson, before he was able to be in the, in the major leagues, in the white major leagues, had been relegated to play in the Negro leagues. And he was taunted a whole lot and, and got a lot of harassment when he started playing with the whites. Those kids started thinking differently about race because they understood more of the picture, right? So if all you're learning about is, whoo, Jackie Robinson, he got into the main, without understanding the context, you can't change racism if you don't know what it's about, right? Now I answered your question? Yeah. Okay. What about particular moments? Oh, have you read the, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who writes in the New Yorker, wrote about Tacoma Mockingbird, and he said, you know, at this finish, you know, it's about this lawyer in, uh, Alabama? Mm -hmm. I'm not English. Um, anyway, this white lawyer in a town, um, defends a black guy against the charge of rape against a white <coughs> woman, right? Gladwell says, let's, let's look at him for a minute. How much change was he really trying to, to have happen finish? Was he really a, an anti-racist hero or not? And we can look at him and say, yes, he bucked the trend. He, was, he told his kids that you needed to respect black people. But if you look more carefully at what he was doing, he was not necessarily challenging the structure of racism or classism in society. Um, and when he talked to his kids about, they, there was a neighbor of theirs or a guy that they knew who basically led this lynch mob. They, the, the, the white guy brought all these other white guys to the courthouse to lynch the black guy who was, in the, who was being held overnight before his trial. And just because little scout Finch says to the white guy, he's, she just starts talking to him, and that's what gets him to leave, is this, is this 12 year old girl, right? But when Atticus talks to his daughter about this white guy, who she knows because he's the father of one of her classmates, he says, no, you know, he's actually a really nice guy. And what Gladwell says is, excuse me? Somebody who is leading a lynch mob, you're characterizing as nice? We need to trouble that characterization that Finch is saying. Now, can we understand the context in which he's talking? Yes. Do we think Harper Lee should have written a different book? No. But should be in our conversations with our students, talk about what it means to think those white folks, they're really nice. They just happen to be leading a lynch mob. <laughs> but that's the way we think. Those white folks are really nice. They just happen to be doing these things that are oppressing a whole lot of people. We don't really want to attack them because they're nice people. 
Do you see how that is a different conversation about most of the time when we teach Atticus Finch and when we teach To Kill a Mockingbird, it's a character study because there's this famous line in the book where he says, you don't know anything about anybody until you walk a mile in their shoes. So that's what teachers do. They say, okay, what would it feel like to walk a mile in Atticus Finch's shoes? What would it feel like to walk a mile in the black guy's shoes, in the white guy's shoes? That's nice, but it doesn't get at the institutional piece. It doesn't get at what makes racism institutionalized. And it's nice folks like the guy who's leading the lynch mob that institutionalize racism. Yeah? Other questions or comments? How would you address, I, I imagine like a, a lot of uh, teachers would get sort of a backlash, like if I was a math teacher, uh, in, in implementing those questions of race in my like math problems and students brought that home and the parents would be like, what if, uh, you're supposed to be learning math, but you know, you'd get a lot of uh, uh, backlash from uh, Thank you. The question was, I'm a math teacher. I'm supposed to be teaching math. My fifth grader goes home, goes home and tells, the, tells her parents that my math teacher is talking about how the black kid had to go around the neighborhood, and so his, his distance was longer. And, and the parent comes to me and says, oh, gats, you're supposed to be teaching these kids math. What are you talk to, talking to them about race about? Right? Great question. I think that this is where that thing that I flashed at you in red comes really into being. Racism is individual and institutional. So you gotta do it individually, but you also gotta do it institutionally. So you don't just do that in your classroom, but you talk to your colleagues, you talk to the principal, you figure out ways that you are, as a unit, going to address this for two reasons. One is it helps you get some support in doing this. And the other is that if a kid just hears that in one class, She's going to leave that class and think, oh yeah, that Mr. Smith, he, he, he talked about race, and she's going to forget it. If a kid hears it across her K-12 experience, where kids, we're, we're, we're being forced to think about the implications of action, we're being forced to think about the ethics of science, we're being forced to think about racism, that kid is going to leave that door a very changed person compared to just having it be you in your math class. But let's get back to your question. You've got the kid and the teach the parent comes back to you. One of the things that I do and that I tell my students to do, I teach teachers, is I say you have to get your ducks in order before you start this. So for example, you may talk to your parents about how you're doing a real world curriculum and they're going to be addressing not just the math but all the real world implications of math problems. And, and you give them, I mean, I gave you an answer for why I thought we should have those different kinds of math problems. It has to do with democracy. If you look at your school's mission statement, most of them say something about global citizen, democracy, something, and you say, this is how I'm helping us fulfill our mission. But I think you gotta, you gotta do that early. You can't just wait for the fire to erupt, right? You have to talk to parents beforehand. You have to get them on board. You have to talk to other teachers. You have to talk to your principal. You have to go out in the community and, and garner support for this kind of thing. Because you do leave yourself vulnerable, especially if you're a beginning teacher. But if you have tenure, <laughs> yeah. Well, I find that um, administrators in the school district that I'm associated with do what they call training, and it's really compliance training. In other words, about the law, and it doesn't really teach uh, and encourage teachers to uh, to weave these things through every aspect of their curriculum. The most emphasis is on um, how to meet the the law and the words of the law. And in essence, what ends up happening is it becomes about how not to get sued. Mm -hmm. And um, I've experienced that personally uh, because of something that I recorded. And the retaliation, and while we do do training and all that stuff, was pretty horrific. And um, I don't know how to encourage, how to educate administrators so that they understand that their job is more than compliance. Like I said, you got a third of the people with you, a third of the people neutral, and a third of the people, it's bad, and a third that are against you are <coughs> That doesn't mean that you can't, however, start to build alliances and get support from other folks. There may be one administrator that you can work with. There may be ways that you can um, go ahead and work on the curriculum in your classroom and not worry too much about what the administrators say. I had a principal, 
and again, she was a very supportive person. But her theory was ask forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> was that out there? I was about to say, oh, I'm glad to have that attribution. Ask forgiveness, not permission. Who said that? I guess it was Eleanor Roosevelt. I didn't know. I don't know my Roosevelt. <laughs> privileges of whiteness. 
which is that we dehumanize ourselves when we oppress others. Wouldn't that be cool if we had that conversation with our other creators? Um, I, I, I want to give you this picture of the staircase so you can remember it, but you've got to keep walking. Um, and I want to leave you with another James Baldwin quote, and then I'm going to uh, open for questions. James Baldwin, when asked, you know, when he's saying, what, what would I want a student to learn, or what, what should teachers teach students? I would try to make students know that just as American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it, so is the world larger, more daring, more beautiful, and more terrible, but principally larger, and that it belongs to them. Mm -hmm.